Welcome to church this morning. A few verses from 2 Samuel this morning. As for God, his way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock? God is my strong fortress. He has made my way safe. I don't know what your week has been like. I'm sure it's been a mixture for all of us. We've had ups and we've had downs. Everybody has. But today, right now, we've come to meet with God and he is our rock and he is our strong fortress. So let's stand and sing, blessed be your name, shall we? We've come into your house and we've come to meet together as your children. No matter what our age, we're your children here today. And Father, we thank you for all you have done for us, all you have given for us. And Father, I pray that, Father, you would instill on our hearts that, that you not just love us, but that you, you desire to do good things within us and for us. And Father, may we seek after you this morning. May we look for you. May we hear you. And Lord God, we just want to commit to you, Lord, Paul, this morning. Father, be with him as he speaks. May people hear your voice this morning. As we prayed earlier as the, as the band, Lord, give us Samuel ears. Father, may we be attentive to what you were telling us and what you were requiring of us. And Lord, give us willing hearts to do what it is you want us to do for you. In Jesus' name. such a little girl. Didn't you see there, she's, how old will she be now, Joy? Oh, yes, yeah, she is. It's July yeah, 2000, yeah, that's right. 
So she's virtually a teenager. Um, now Estelle lives, lives with, with her parents and she does lots of nice things at home. Um, there are two children in her family. Um, there's times that her dad is, has a job and times he hasn't got a job. And his mum works as a market vendor. Estelle likes playing with dolls and she likes playing with her friends and she likes playing jump, and, jump rope and skipping, uh, singing, which I guess is skipping, yeah? But, and she attends Sunday school and church and Bible class regularly, which is really good. Um, and one of the really good things, and this is how our support and the support of other churches helps little girls like Estelle, because it says here, she attends school where her performance is above average. So, you know, which is really good. So, should we pray for Estelle? Just bring her, bring her before the Lord. Dear Lord, we pray for this little girl, Estelle, uh, who lives in, in Burkina Faso in Africa. Lord, and there's many stresses and strains on her life. There's the, her family don't have much money. And they're very grateful for the support that they get from Compassion. Thank you, Lord, for the work that Compassion do. Thank you, Lord, for their support of many children around the world, many needy children, Lord, who, without the support of Compassion, without your support through Compassion, would, would, would have lives, Lord, which are, are just not great. But, Lord, we thank you for Estelle, and we ask you to bless her and to help her sort of continue to be well above average at school and to go on to, to serve you in, in a in a wonderful way, Lord, and we ask, Lord, that you will guide her and lead her and touch her family. And right where she is now, probably an hour or so in front of us on the time clock, Lord, we ask you to bless her now and to lay your hands upon her. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn the sound up.
So MAF, when um, James, if you wouldn't mind just running the, there's a PowerPoint on there, just run it silently in the background. I'm not going to go through it, it's just really a reminder to some of you about what MAF's about. And there's some pictures on there, it's mainly pictures. Uh, just, just leave it to run, it'll just turn over. Um, as to why we need planes to get people over and, and through sort of difficult terrain and things like that in, in remote areas, and you'll see something come up. But I'd like us to have a, a, a time of prayer uh, for a few minutes about MAF, really about some of the things going around the world. And I've got this, pity it's not a slide, um, but basically there's a few sort of things going on around the world, really, which would be really good if, you, if you'd like to, to pray for. Um, things like in places like um, Tanzania in South East Africa, sort of South East Africa, just south of Kenya. Uh, we're building, we need to build some new airstrips, basically to reach some more people and to get planes in there. So it's really about all the arrangements of funding and the government permissions and so on to do that. Um, in Mongolia, uh, there's some staffing issues, actually getting people to, even sort of European people sometimes, to go out and live in Mongolia, which if you, put, if you know anything about Mongolia, that's why you need a plane, by the way. That's a road after the wet season in, uh, in Africa. Um, Living on, in Mongolia is quite tough because it can be 40 odd degrees Celsius plus in the summer and minus 40 degrees Celsius in the winter. Uh, really, you know, it, it really is like that virtually every year. Um, out, out of the way places. We do need a few more planes for, for some things. Um, <clears throat> children in Congo. You've probably seen on the news there's lots of war in Congo, uh, civil war, a very vicious civil war. Um, and there's, there are some groups of children that, we try, that some of the agencies are trying to reach because they need basic vaccines for things like measles and polio. Um, but we need to get those people in, and sometimes the ability and the permissions, etc., you need to fly in to get teams into those people to do the medical emergencies and, and things like that is, uh, need, needs, needs prayer. God needs to open some doors. Um, especially in places like Congo, uh, it's praying for MAF staff because they struggle to make Jesus known in a culture that, although it's open to Christianity, um, just needs to know they've got to be redeemed, put it, put it bluntly. Um, so, there's, so there's a few things to pray for. Really, if you'd like to pray for the people we're trying to reach, um, for MAF, to be enabled to do things, you know, to, to, for their aircraft to reach certain places, um, to get permissions to fly, all the things that we're now involved in doing. Yeah, you know, satellite, we've got a satellite communications arm, because uh, you need that to get phones going in certain parts of the world. Um, you know, organisations like Flame, I put that up because I thought it was a really nice little picture, Flame International. So really, if we can have a, a oh, few minutes prayer for Matt, that would be, be really good. good. And, I, and I'll close to enable and them I'll to leave, do I'll what you call them to the do. Lord, to be servants of, to be your servants, to, to fly, to enable, to take people and urgent supplies and medical teams and preachers and teachers and Bibles and support teams, Lord, to those remote places in the world where people really have, there's really no other means to do it. And Lord, I pray you, you give MAF wisdom in the way that it conducts its negotiations with foreign governments, with the aviation authorities in, in, in countries around the world. Lord, where times the ugly head of corruption rises and MAF has to say no and stand back. Lord, I pray, Lord, you give them wisdom. Give the managers wisdom in those countries to, to handle those things in the way you, that you would want them handled. And that as your Holy Spirit opens the door to things, Lord, that they'll be ready to go through that door. Think of places like Nepal, Lord, where it's been difficult to get a plane flying for some time because of corruption in the local government wanting bribes to sign agreements and, and operating certificates and things. 
Lord, pray for that country, which we hear so much about because lots of people go and climb mountains in Nepal. But Lord, the people, some of the people there really struggle. But most of all, Lord, need to hear your message. So Lord, please, please keep MAF. We pray, Lord, that you will strengthen MAF's operation, Lord, that it will have everything it needs to do your will, to carry on serving you in the places that you've called it to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you. I'll leave that running. Um, if... Um, Calendar, 2013. Okay, that is. Um, if I speak anywhere, I normally show this stuff off. But there's um, some calendars. Um, if you want to make a donation, have a calendar for next year. If, because you know, I keep going on about it. Um, if you'd like to know more about math, there's, that comes out once every two or three months. It's, it's, the, uh, the, it's the quarterly magazine. Okay? And the reason that I've got this stuff and whatever is because they've just rebranded the logo. What's happened in MAF is that it was originally run on the Americans, that's my word, the Americans, the Europeans and Africans, and the people in Australia, you know, covering parts of Southeast Asia. They've just brought the organization together to be one proper global organization so that we try and make better use of all the resources. Um, hence, some of this new stuff. Um, if you, I'll leave that form at the back. If anybody would like to have one of these, um, we'd like you to sign it, simply because I don't want to sign it, and then someone gets sent a magazine and think, oh, did I really say yes? Um, if you'd like to put your name down to have one of these sent, it's absolutely free. And what you get as well, you get a very small version of this, which is a prayer diary with pictures of real people and, and what they're doing and, and why we're asking you to pray for them. So, um, for the magazine, it's, quite, it's, 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 it's a good read. It basically tells you everything that's going on. I mean, this, this year, for instance, Arnhem Land in the, in, the, in the islands north of Australia. You wouldn't think, obviously, some of the Aboriginal tribes out there are beginning to get very switched on to the gospel, which is fantastic. Um, it was, a, it was a, a place a couple of years ago, I think, where they lost a pilot who crashed into the sea. He was only 23, um, from his Australian pilot, and uh, we never found him because the currents took the wreckage of the plane, his body, somewhere, and, and the, the, um, the Australian Navy could never find, the, find his body. Um, but the people there really need, need, need the help of people that math fly in. And as you can see, sort of the MAF pilots actually get involved as well, which is really good. So um, in building those kind of relationships and, and just bringing Jesus to people, very simply in the conversations. Often when a plane lands somewhere, as you can see, stuff happens. Um, that guy there, that pilot, Nick Swan, was on his way somewhere and was, there was a medical emergency because a poor chap in the uh, stretcher had been bitten by a poison snake. So you go to hospital pretty quick. So... As all those kind of things happen. And I'm sorry, it's a bit of a man thing, but there's a great picture on there you've probably seen of a plane in the middle of a road where the pilot had landed it in the middle of a road. The week before, um, there was a very organised and very big terrorist group called the M23 in, I think it's Congo, who'd, who'd gone there and occupied the village the week before. And then they'd been booted out, so MAF flew a plane in there to see what they needed and, and take some supplies and things in. So that's the kind of thing MAF does. And that's our new truck, which you might one day see me driving. Um, we've got a small one and a big one now. Because there's a, there's a transport company in, in Sheffield, who the, the owner is, is a great supporter of MAF, and basically gives MAF stuff like that, which is amazing. And gets it all kitted out, and as, as a, basically there's an exhibition display truck, which is fantastic. So, with no further ado, I think we'd better go on to the offering. But thank you very much for praying for MAF. And I'll leave that, we'll leave that running, Caroline, for a bit, please. And we'll sing um, our offering song, Everlasting God.
this morning was it's called Running the Race of Faith. Now, faith is very important when you're a Christian, as you know. And it's also a bit of a race because it can last for quite a long time um, if we live long and fruitful lives. And so I really, really, really want to talk about, talk about that. And based, the text I've got today is, is based on Hebrews chapter 12. If anyone's got any Bibles. Hebrews chapter 12. And you'll be relieved to know it's only the first three verses. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. 1 to 3. Because I found in my life as a Christian... That actually being faithful and sticking with it <laughs> is one of the most important things I do on a daily basis. 12, 1 to 3, and I'm reading for the NIV. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So what's it about then, this running, running the race of faith? Well, I think Jesus wants two things from us today. To have faith in him. And if you're not a Christian this morning, he really, really wants you to find that faith in him. And if you have found him, he wants you to be steadfast in that faith. The Bible warns us against um, developing unbelief. In, um, don't look it up, but... Uh, Hebrews, Hebrews, a bit later on in Hebrews, chapter um, 13. Um, it says this, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, so as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So it's about sticking with it. So we need to make sure we don't start to develop sort of unbelief in, 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 in Jesus in ways, you know, that, you know, well, that bit about him is true, but this bit about it isn't true. I'm not quite sure of that, but I like this and so on and so forth. But we all need to have a faith that actually endures, that lasts us all our lives here on earth. And chapter 11, as you know, I'm not going to go through it, but chapter 11 mentions lots of individuals in the past in the Bible who've been who've, who've shown great faith who've been um, given great honour and they're given great honour in the word of the Lord because they've had great faith people like uh, Jacob and Joseph and Moses and um, Rahab uh, lots of them Samuel, the, the other prophets, lots of people there mentioned in, in effect it's a bit like, like a hall of fame, it's like a hall of faith But faith is really, as you know, most of you, is a heartfelt trust directed in Jesus. And it's a heartfelt trust you have in Jesus. Because if we've got faith and that heartfelt trust in Jesus, we respond to him uh, whatever the cost. Because, you know, for us sometimes in our world, it's difficult being a Christian. It's difficult following Jesus. And we have lots of influences around us which distract us. Uh, things which people... Of negative about, uh, about Christianity and about our faith to us and so on and so forth but you know having faith in Jesus means stubbornly hanging on and it means stubbornly hanging on sometimes when your prayers aren't answered and as I, as I said to the young people last week when they came around to us in short to me faith means walking with God on a daily basis you know though sometimes you know, walking on with my little boys they sometimes said daddy can we have this um, and sometimes I say no, or sometimes I don't want to do it, but I want to try and avoid it. So, you know, I don't, I don't give them an answer. 
And it's sometimes like that with Jesus, isn't it? You know, we walk with Jesus every day, hopefully all of you. Um, and sometimes we'll pray for someone that's really on our hearts, and sometimes an answer doesn't come. Now that's when we need faith to keep walking. And the amazing thing about Hebrews 11, with all these people who were commended for their faith, is that a lot of them had this enduring assistance in trusting in God um, in the face of great tragedy or great trial. Even think about Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he sweated blood because the pressure and the stress and the fear in him was so great because he knew what was going to happen, he asked his father to take it away from him. So did his father take it away from him? No. He went to the cross for you and me. But he still had strong faith and a strong relationship with his father in heaven. <clears throat> so faith is not wishful thinking, but it's not a leap in the dark either. It's actually a walk in the light of what God tells us about Jesus and what God's revelation is to, uh, revelation to us in Jesus. <clears throat> you know, really, sometimes to have faith, we've got to follow and do it in God's way. It's not just about, oh, I want this or I want that and, oh, I don't get it, so I'm going to be in a huff and, and all that kind of thing. Because having faith in, in the Lord and daily walking with him means that should create a right attitude in us. It should really change us. And it should lead you, in terms of what you do in your life, to leave a, leave a legacy. Now you might think, oh, I don't. What, 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 what are you talking about, Paul? Leave a legacy. Because of my faithful service as a Christian in helping other people or doing things in the church or doing thing, other things, which you do because you believe in Jesus and you have a faith. Well, a legacy can be being a blessing to other people. Through, but through faith and sticking with it, you can achieve great things and you can make great choices and decisions. One of the things I was trying to do last Sunday with the young people was link having faith in Jesus to being leaders, because they're the future. The future to do what? Well, that's what they need to find out from God. But they all need to be part of great, God's great plan to change and bring change and, and, um, and blessing to wherever they are. And one of the great examples of radical faith was Noah. Now Noah showed this radical obedience to God. Um, and it wasn't just, it's, it's, it sounds like a great children's story with animals on the water. But basically, he responded to God's instruction to build the ark. And it's a story that everybody knows really well. But it might have seemed crazy, but he showed great faith simply because he did what God commanded him to do. God told him, go and build an ark. And he did what God commanded him to do because he loved God enormously and he had great faith in him. And because he had this great love for God, God grew his faith. So despite all the derision and all of the, the comments from his neighbours and everything else he could probably imagine went on for some considerable period of time while he was building the ark in the middle of nowhere, a long way from the sea, God grew his faith. So it's that being in that relationship of, of loving God and God loving us and blessing us that we find that our faith grows. But clearly with Noah, he showed that he had great faith because he persistently adhered to God's wishes. And Noah embodied the, uh, Noah, what, what, what we could say, Noah embodied what we could say, what we really believe, we live by. So if you have a faith in God and you really believe in Jesus to change your life, to walk with you every day, we really believe that, then we live by it. Someone who believes, I want to be the greatest athlete in history, lives by that and they train every day. And then they hopefully go on to win an Olympic medal. But they live by it. They really believe, I have the talent to do this, and this is what I'm supposed to do, and this is what I'm going to do every day. But faith gave Noah this enduring quality of having a beautiful life. There's a few historians at the time have written about him, saying that essentially because he was, he was such a great guy, because he had great faith in the Lord, it just showed. 
You know, sometimes when, it, when, when our lives overflow, we're a blessing to other people because we bring God's presence into their lives through our faith. Noah, through the way he lived his life, a life of faith, trusting in God, carrying on building the ark, despite people saying, oh, what are you doing that for? And thinking he was crazy. Because this did go on for a number of years. Possibly up to 100, if you read the Bible. And look, look at the dates. But what Noah did was he, he demonstrated through having faith that holy living and reverence for God. And therefore made a declaration about who God is which probably convicted some people around him. You know, some people are negative about you sometimes when you're a Christian. <coughs> Maybe it's because actually what you're doing and the way you live in your lives is such an example to them, they actually feel a bit guilty. Because Noah, and us, because he was a man, and we're men and women, was the light of the world and the salt of the earth, wasn't he? But you know, even with derision and, and, and people um, calling him mad, it probably didn't bother him at all. You know, he just kind of got on with it. But Hebrew, Hebrews, what the text I've just read, 12, 1 to, 1 to 3, just emphasises this need to run this great race of faith. You know, we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, whether they are people already in heaven or Christians around us. There's a great cloud of witnesses um, which are there sort of supporting us, who are there sort of around. And a lot of those witnesses here are in Hebrews 11. And there's a great crowd of witnesses to this in Caldecott and Chepstow, because they're here. Look at the Anglican Church, look at the Methodist. There's, they may not be a huge cloud, but there are quite a few of them. So how do you run a race of faith? Well, there's kind of three things. The first thing is that we need to let some things go, don't we? Think about a runner as it's been an Olympic year. Think about what a runner does to win. Well, they lose as much weight as possible without hurting their performance. And they wear clothing that's light and it allows freedom of movement so they don't have trousers that chaff around their legs and things like that. Because all that excess weight and all that lack of freedom of movement can be the difference between victory and defeat. Literally, if it's a few seconds. And you know, it seems to me that Jesus always travelled light, didn't he? He had his 12 disciples with him, but he didn't know the house, didn't know, didn't know. There was just Jesus, and, you know, he didn't have lots of stuff around him, did he? So in the same way that a runner trains and gets himself fit and travels light, we too have got to let some things go. Now these things are, by every weight, I mean things like the things that slow down our spiritual progress. We've got lots of distractions, don't we? You know, we're, we're, lots of people look for happiness in other areas of life, like work or getting stuff. You know, I'm not happy with the car I'm driving, so you know, I, I want something a bit better. Or, you know, I, I really do need that new, that new mobile phone. Um, but you know, even though we can get a lot of fulfilment through um, doing the work that Jesus wants and really throwing ourselves into it and doing it well for him and so on and so forth, um, there's a lot of bad influences around us that can actually prevent us from living that life of faith and trusting Jesus. Because too many responsibilities and burdens can weigh you down. So think about the runner, what the runner does to win, and think about these things that, that weigh you down. You know, the cares of life, as the Bible talks about, the Bible calls it. Um, malice, anger, stuff like that. Stuff that really, all of a sudden, something happens and some of your flaws come out. You know, we've all got flaws. Um, I've got loads of them. You know, but sometimes in a certain situation, it'll trigger something in it, won't it? Trigger something in us, won't it? Um, but if that's clearly not how God wants us to behave or do or, or believe, then that will hinder 
our spiritual progress. And things like that make running the race of faith very difficult. And the Bible talks about, you know, this thing called the sin that so easily ensnares us. To run the race of faith, it's a straightforward thing to say, but we've got to really hard, try really hard to stop sinning. So repent and leave them at the foot of the cross. And then go away and don't do them anymore. Because if you've got loads of sins around you, loads of things that you are not doing in the way that God wants you to do, they will be a burden and they'll weigh you down. But if you really trust Jesus and you want to walk with him every day, you want to pray to him every day, talk to him every day, read your Bible, just, just this, this, even when it's tough, you know, and there's a headwind blowing and it's a cold headwind and you're there walking through the day and you're kind of like that and it's hard. But I tell you something, if you're walking with Jesus, Jesus is doing that and he's pulling you along. You know, it's like the old, the old uh, example of the, the footprints in the sand, isn't it? Oh, they only saw one, but that was because Jesus was carrying them. And it was Jesus' footprints in the sand, not theirs. But the key thing about running the race of faith is that God has marked out for each one of you a course, something he plans and something he wants for your life. But to actually run that race of faith, you've got to have endurance, and you've got to stick with it. And by having that endurance and sticking with it, God will build up your character. Because you'll need that character and that testing and the ability to move on once you've been through those periods of testing with that you know, better character. You'll need that to run the race of faith. So we've got the runner. The runner, you know, trains, loses all this excess weight, doesn't have any... Basically, when he's there on the starting line, he is there... Think of Usain Bolt, think of Mo Farah, people like that. They are there on the starting line, focused, they're going to go. And they're, they're, they've prepared themselves. And they're dressed, they're trained, and they're fit and they're ready. Because the race of faith is a marathon, it's not a sprint. It doesn't require one quick energetic burst of faith to get it through some difficult circumstances. And then, oh, well, you know... There's something else on the horizon, but I'm a bit tired now. I'm not going to trust Jesus too much for that. Because the race of faith isn't over very quickly. If you live your three score years and ten, you know, there'll be many times when something's coming over the hill. And sometimes it's a monster, and sometimes it isn't. But there are... But faith, the race of faith is a marathon. And by that I mean it needs a kind of a, sta a sustained effort in believing and walking with Jesus every day over a long period of time. And Jesus talked to, to his disciples about this need for endurance, or you might call it patience. Um, you know, in the parable of the sower, he talks about, you know, where the seed is, is scattered on the path, you know, and there are the ones who hear the message, but the devil goes and takes it away because they hear the message and then forget about it or they don't know anything about it and it's taken away from them. He told them to be patient and to be ready for opposition when he sent them out on that limited commission. I talked about it in Matthew 10, I preached on it not that long ago, where he sent the disciples out two by two for, for a short period of time and they did amazing things. And in Matthew 24, and I will read this little bit, Verse 13. And I find this through, and the reason why the race of faith is so important to each one of us, because I find this a lot when I read things like that, things like this. Because he says this. Jesus says, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. I've known people, friends of mine, who who walked away from the faith, walked away from being a Christian. I think that's a tremendous tragedy. You know, genuinely have, for reasons I've, I can't understand. And I pray that they'll come back.
But endurance is a necessity because in 24.13, he or she who stands firm to the end will be saved. Stands firm to the end. And you know, God helps us to develop this, insur- uh, develop this endurance. How does he do that? Well, is God faithful to you? Is he? Yeah? And he's made promises we can trust in. Now, some of those promises don't happen now. They might happen in 30, 40 years' time. But he's made promises to you. But the ultimate for us is that we persevere in this faithfulness, to just keep walking with Jesus every day. Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about it in Romans 2, in verse 7. He, just, he, he says this, Paul wrote that eternal life will be given to those who by patient continuous in doing good seek for glory, honour and immortality. So therefore he's saying, you need endurance. You need to run the race of faith. Don't give up on it. Stick with it. Even when you don't quite understand what's going on in your life or you think, well, actually, I've been praying for three ages and it's not happened yet. You know, God works in his own way and he will bring about blessing and he will bless you in the way that he's chosen to and the way he's planned to because he knows what the future's going to be. We don't. So we've looked at the runner. And we've talked about the need for endurance. So the third area is really that we need to focus on Jesus. You've got to keep your focus and keep walking with Jesus every day and look to Jesus for everything. You know, when a runner, when Mo Farah is running around the Olympic track, what's he doing? You see where his eyes are. He's focusing, and he's not here at the moment, by the way, he's just an example, but he's... He's focusing that bit ahead on the track and he's aware of what's going on around him and he's looking straight ahead. And he's he's focusing going forward. (coughs) And we might look around at what other people are doing, like a runner does in a race, to see where, when do I do my kick to to sprint for the line, so to be aware. (coughs) But ultimately, we need to keep our face and our gaze on God, on Jesus. You know, Jesus is there in the front. When, When... when the Israelites were being chased by Pharaoh's army before they reached the Red Sea, they had to keep following the cloud and the frame and the flame in front of them uh, to follow God's way out, didn't they? And they had to keep looking ahead. And it's almost like there's a little bit of a formula for spiritual success, but there isn't really. But you could sum up lots of things by saying, if you want to be distressed, look within. If I, if some of the flaws I've got to tell you, as Lynn will probably, don't, well, don't tell, tell anybody Lynn. But, you know, some of the flaws I've got, I'd be quite distressed if I thought about myself for too long. So if you want to be distressed, look within. If you want to be defeated, look back. Stop running, because everybody overtakes you. If you want to be distracted, well, look around at all the other things you can have that distract you from being a Christian, from from living out your faith in in doing what Jesus asked you to do. If Noah had decided to stop building the boat, what do you think would have happened? None of the animals and none of the people would have been saved from the flood. Because God knew the big plan, didn't he? And God knew what was going to happen. God knew what he was going to bring about. And it was (coughs) critically important that Noah followed exactly what God had asked him to do. So if you want to be distracted, look around. Just do what your neighbours do. Just, you know, just... Spend your money unwisely on on, on things you shouldn't and so on. And if you want to be dismayed sometimes, and this is us, look ahead. I will be dismayed because sometimes when we look ahead and see what might be coming up in our lives or I feel I've got this job to do and I don't really want to do it, trusting in our own selves, sometimes we can be a bit dismayed. But if you want to be delivered, where do you look? So if you want to be distressed, look within. If you want to be defeated, look back. If you want to be distracted, look around. If you want to be dismayed, look ahead. But if you want to be delivered, look up. 
and read Colossians 3 because it talks about it. For Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's been blazing the trail for us. The Bible talks about him being the Alpha and the Omega, the, the first and the last. So Jesus has been blazing a trail for us. He entered heaven, the heavenly sanctuary, before, before we are. He's shown us how to live a life of being a Christian, what the Bible talks about being a new and living way. You know, a new way to live, a new way to, you know, a new way to walk with God. And you know he's going to help you finish that race as well. Because you're not alone. What inspired Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, Jesus ran the race of faith then and succeeded because he looked at the joy that was going to be set before him. He was going to go to heaven. The joy that Jesus looked forward to was the privilege of sitting at God's right hand in heaven. And when Jesus was anticipating all of that joy, that's what helped him through the cross. Because he endured the cross for you and I, the physical pain, the terrible pain that would have, you know, having nails hammered into you would have been so painful. And he, he endured being despised by virtually everybody around him. He endured all his friends, his disciples, running away. Because he looked forward, he looked ahead, he looked up. And he could see where he was going. He could see what the Father had planned for him. So yeah, that was quite a motivation. And Jesus endured a lot of hostility during his life on earth, didn't he? He constantly was heckled and, and constantly was argued with by the religious leaders of the day who actually knew very little and who completely misunderstood the Old Testament. And sometimes if, if running this race of faith, in, in, in being patient and enduring life sometimes when you're going through difficult situations as a Christian, we become weary, we become discouraged, don't we? But just think of Jesus on the cross. <coughs> think of Jesus uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane, where he wanted that to be taken away from him. The, 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 human, part, the human side of Jesus wanted that to be taken away, but it wasn't. And he went through because he could see the joy that was set before him. If he endured all the things that God wanted him to endure and go through in his life, he could see that joy ahead. <coughs> it's the same for us. Now, we're not going to sit at God's right hand, but as it says in Matthew 24, 13, if you stand firm to the end, it's fantastic. So to conclude, and I realise for some of you it's probably course to one, so I'll, do, I'll, I'll finish so we can pray. So there's two sides to running this race of faith. One is negative and one's positive. It's negative because we've got to put aside some things which hinder us, which get in the way. But it's positive because we keep our eyes on Jesus every day because he is the one who's made your salvation possible. And in both cases, what this says is crucial. This is a favourite Bible of mine, by the way. I, I, had, I bought this when I was about 18. <laughs> so uh, and it's still in one piece. Because the Bible will tell you what sort of things you've got to lay aside. And what the Bible tells us, it tells us about the way Jesus endured all the pressures and strains and all the difficulties and how his example of leadership and, and, li and living his life is an example to each one of us. And that's really what I want to say. Remember the runner. Remember how a runner trains. How a runner is prepared to start running the race on the starting line. Remember that you need endurance to run the race of faith. You need to trust Jesus every day, even when life isn't so good. But also when life is good. 
when you're distracted by other things because things are really good. And all of a sudden, you know, what can stop me now? Well, that's sometimes when we get bitten, isn't it? Something happens to stop us. But run the race of faith because as the Bible promises us that if we do that, at the end we'll be saved. And that's a fantastic promise because that is the joy set for you at the end just as it was the joy for Jesus. I'm going to finish now and have a short time of prayer to end. Just sit and contemplate about being faithful. You know, thinking about how you're going to walk with Jesus every day. And just ask him to bless you and to help you to do that because, you know, there's a lot of distractions out there. You sometimes... You can't sit and think about Jesus and, and, and do work sometimes. But just, just being open to him uh, and to and just remember him during the day is so important. Remember that you are, if you're a Christian, you are walking with Jesus. John always says, thank you for listening. And go and have a sleep. Some of you are a bit tired. Let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship.